Hello again, fellows. This is Gary back, and uh, this time I'm going to talk to you about measuring galaxies rather than measuring stars. To remind you from something I spoke about in the astrometry lecture, we can classify our measurements of point sources and resolve sources into what moment we're trying to measure. And the first half of this lecture will be about this issue up here, getting fluxes of galaxies. And then in the second part of this lecture, we'll talk about measuring the shapes and sizes, which is a relatively newcomer to the astronomical measurement world, and we use it for weak gravitational lensing. All right, so let's get on with photometry. Uh, in stellar photometry and astrometry, you've seen that there is actually a best way to do that, which is uh, either equal to or equivalent to PSF fitting or model fitting. There is no such analogy in galaxy photometry, so we don't have a single best way of doing things. And in fact, uh, galaxy photometry is really not at the level of development as stellar photometry. It would, it's fairly rare, at least uh, maybe until very recently, to find catalogs of galaxy fluxes that claim accuracy than better than 1% or 10 millimags. So our question is, you know, are extragalactic observers just uh, that much dumber than stellar observers? Well, in fact, there are good reasons why galaxy photometry is not as advanced as stellar photometry. One is that the quantity itself, the flux of a galaxy, is not necessarily well defined. There are no edges. There's no hard edge to a galaxy, and the stars just basically keep going. Um, so to decide what is the magnitude of a galaxy uh, is, is involves some judgment on the user's part. Uh, or you have to take what you see on the inside and sort of extrapolate to what you would find outside your aperture. Another problem with galaxies that stars don't have as much is that they can easily overlap on the sky, right? They are uh, at least partly transparent. So when you have two galaxies overlapping each other, you have to separate their light, and that's called deblending, and that's a big long story that I won't try to get into. But the main reason that galaxy photometry is harder than stars is because all stars look the same. As far as the Rubin Observatory is concerned, they're all point sources, delta functions, before the PSF is applied. But galaxies come in an infinite variety of appearances, just like people. Right? So we could try model fitting, but we don't have a model for galaxies. You don't know which model to apply to which galaxy in advance of actually seeing it. So there is uh, really no way to even derive what perfection would be um, if you don't know in advance for some reason what a particular galaxy actually looks like. Okay. Um, so the flip side of this is that I don't know of any science that actually depends critically on knowing the total magnitudes of galaxies to an accuracy of better than 1%. Um, you know, if you were doing an inventory of all the galaxies light in the universe or something like that, you probably wouldn't mind if there's a 1% error on each galaxy or if you underestimate all of them by 1% because the science of galaxy evolution is not really working at 1% accuracy. However, there is something that we care about to high accuracy, which is colors of galaxies, because those are used uh, in conjunction with things like uh, stellar populations to decide what's going on in a galaxy and to measure their redshifts with photometric redshifts. So we will push for higher accuracy for colors, which is not necessarily the same as we'll see about pushing for high accuracy on the flux itself. Okay. So just to illustrate, here's a nice picture from the Dark Energy Survey of uh, one of the so-called Hickson compact groups. And I challenge you, even if you thought there was no noise in this image whatsoever, to decide how much of the light in this image belongs to each of these galaxies, right? What would you even call the total flux? And even if you decided something, then to extract it from this image would be pretty tough, right? And of course, these galaxies don't look like perfect de Vaucouleur or exponential profiles either. So we don't have models for these. All right, a couple of things I won't delve into. One, as I mentioned, is deep blending or crowding, which would be really important, for instance, in that compact group. I won't talk about a couple of things that you've already seen or will hear about in uh, stellar photometry. They're also important is determining the zero point, how many electrons in your image is how much flux in physical units. That's the same process as for stellar photometry. 
Sky subtraction remains important for galaxy photometry, just as it is for stellar photometry. In fact, more important because galaxies, being bigger and puffier, have more sky underneath them, and they tend to be lower surface brightness. So the, uh, an error in the sky estimation is a bigger error, typically, in a galaxy's magnitude than in a star's. And also, I won't talk about color terms. They exist for galaxies, just as they do for stars. Uh, but uh, in fact, they're a little tougher for galaxies because stars have a fairly limited number of possible spectra. Galaxies have a bigger variety. And in fact, one part of a galaxy could have a different color than another part of a galaxy. So what do you do about that? All right, I won't delve into that. I'm just going to jump right into a discussion of algorithms for extracting the magnitudes or fluxes of isolated galaxies from a, a monochromatic image. All right. So there's five kind of families here uh, that I'll go over. Fixed radius apertures, isophotal magnitudes, and then so-called uh, what I'll call adaptive apertures, which go by many different names. There are many different methods here. Then there's model fitting. And then I want to talk about something that is unique. That, so many of those are uh, familiar from concepts from stellar photometry. But this idea of using pre-seeing aperture fluxes or moments that's kind of unique to galaxies, so we'll get to that too. Okay. All right, so what do you want out of your galaxy flux measurement? Uh, here's a list of things you might want. Okay, One is that you might want to get the so-called total magnitude, that is, all the light that's coming from all the stars. That may not be important, though, depending on your science. You want to maximize, if you can, the signal-to-noise ratio of your flux measurement, right, to make it as accurate as possible. You also want a measurement that's going to return the same number for that galaxy for images that are taking in different seeing or in different noise levels. Okay? Because for Rubin, for instance, the seeing and the noise level will not be the same for every galaxy in every part of the survey. There'll be more or fewer exposures in better or different conditions. Right? But you would like to have a, a measurement that is uh, unbiased or robust to those conditions. Another important thing for many purposes is to have what I'll call a true color. That is, if I have, say, a G-band picture and an R-band picture and I get a flux from both, I would like both of those G and R-band measurements to have weighted each star in the galaxy the same way. Okay? I don't want a G-band measurement that has, you know, includes more or fewer stars of the galaxy than the R-band because then it's not re really measuring the color of any particular stellar population. Okay? So we want to, if we can, match what I'll call the pre-seeing aperture before the PSF is applied. Okay. Uh, another consideration I won't get into is some methods are easier to deal with. Some of these photometries are easier to deal with in a blended situation than others. Okay. So there are these different criteria here. And one of the main lessons here is that what kind of magnitude you use will depend on what kind of science you want to do. Which of these criteria is the most important for you? because there is no unique best measurement for galaxy fluxes. All right, so let's start with one that's straightforward, familiar to us from stars, fixed aperture. Just draw a circle around your galaxy of a chosen radius and add up all the pixels inside. So this is nice and simple. That's a pro for this. And uh, the error, the uncertainty in this measurement is straightforward, especially in a background noise limited uh, flux which is almost always the case, by the way, for ground-based galaxy photometry. The variance of the flux is just our sky noise variance n times the area of the aperture, which is just pi r squared for this top hat aperture. Okay. And uh, the mean flux in this aperture will be stable under different noise levels. Uh, and if you make the aperture big enough, you can guess that you're including more and more and more of the flux of that galaxy uh, and so you can get a closer approximation to total until you start to run into neighboring objects and have to worry about somehow subtracting them. Okay. Now there's an important thing to recognize here, which is that a aperture magnitude is not stable in different seeing conditions. Remember what seeing does is it takes stars that are uh, photons that are coming from one direction and it spreads them out. And it means that some of the photons that would have landed into this aperture are pushed outside of it by the seeing and vice versa. But in general, because more photons were born inside the aperture, more are pushed out of the aperture than are pulled in. 
So an aperture flux will get lower as the scene gets worse. And of course, it will also get more biased uh, and more susceptible to seeing as we tighten that aperture in to where it gets into the guts of the galaxy, right? So as we had with stellar aperture, with stellar photometry, for apertures, we have a trade-off that the big apertures are more complete. There's less light missing. That also means they're less susceptible to PSF variation, but it also means the noise is large. So you would want to shrink the aperture maybe uh, until it's a little bit bigger than the size of your galaxy. And that's going to be different for each galaxy because unlike stars, galaxies come in different sizes, right? So a single fixed aperture flux is generally not all that useful if you're trying to do something precise with galaxies. Okay. All right, so there's another class that I'm going to of apertures that you'll see in a lot of um, especially older catalogs called isophotal. And that's where we look at our image and we only count in the flux of the galaxy those pixels whose flux is above a certain level or certain surface brightness or also known as a certain isophote. Okay. So you can see this is pretty simple to execute too and it's going to do pretty well for you on signal to noise because by only including the pixels that have a lot of signal uh, you increase your signal to noise level. You don't use a lot of empty but noisy pixels. All right. Um, but on the other hand, these are very hard to figure out. Um, the noise will make a pixel pop in or out of the aperture. So that induces biases and it's very hard to estimate what the true noise level is. And of course, the isophote might be different as you smear the image out with seeing, might be different in different um, bands. So these are not very stable. Uh, I can't think of a lot of cases where you want to use them these days. Um, then something that's very common is called an adaptive aperture. And this sort of solves, a, uh, it's like using an aperture flux, but you adjust the aperture's size and maybe also even its ellipticity so that it is a good match to each particular galaxy. So all galaxies get a different, their own size and maybe shape of aperture. Uh, there are a few well-known variants of this. One is called Crone Magnitudes, which uh, Manuel Bertin adapted a bit to what's called Mag Auto in Sextractor, which is very commonly used. And in this case, you adjust uh, the aperture to be a certain multiple of, say, the first radial moment of the galaxy's light. Okay. Um, another thing that is you'll see using is sometimes called a Petrosian Magnitude. And there you adjust the size and, uh, of your aperture until the average surface brightness inside your aperture is some multiple of the average surface brightness around the boundary. Okay. So these are prescriptions that are meant to be fairly stable as you look at images with different noise levels that you would get the same answer. But they are still, for galaxies that are not much bigger than the PSF, they're both still susceptible to the effects of seeing. Okay. Uh, and then another thing that's related is called a matched Gaussian aperture, which I will talk about a bit later in the second part of this, where you, you can put a, um, a Gaussian aperture on your galaxy, but you adjust its size and shape so that it somewhat matches the size and shape or the second moments of the pixels that are inside that you measure under that aperture. So these are all kind of iterative processes in a way. You have to adjust the aperture till it matches your galaxy and that can take a few steps. Okay. So these apertures are a pretty good compromise between getting the total flux and um, getting good signal to noise. And in fact, they can be tweaked a little bit so that for common galaxies like exponential disks, that they are uh, rather robust to uh, that they always get a pretty constant fraction of the total light. Okay. So those are the plus size. The, the downsides here are again that these are seeing dependent unless you're talking about a galaxy uh, that leads to an aperture that's much bigger than the PSF, in which case the fraction of light leaking in or out is pretty small. Okay. Uh, and also the fact that these are iterative means it's very hard to derive a probability for distribution, a true probability distribution for the noise in these fluxes. But these are uh, something that is useful, that are useful, right? These kinds of fluxes. 
Um, and if you want something that's close to total but doesn't have a lot of noise, um, or if you have big, well-resolved galaxies, you can get pretty good colors out of them by using adaptive apertures with fairly generous apertures. Okay, now I want to talk about model fitting, which we saw was uh, the you know the ace for stellar photometry. Um, most galaxy model fitting assume that galaxies follow what are called elliptical surcage models, where the surface brightness is e to the minus r scaled by some parameter to the one over n. And this n s is called the surcage index. We can also rewrite it this way, where, uh, where there's another number out front that depends on n, and uh, that r e is what's called the effective radius. That's the radius that will hold half the light. And this r argument here uh, is sort of a um, an elliptical radius it, defined by the second here so that we have uh, the aperture can have different lengths on the x and y axes uh, which uh, turns into a circular aperture for e of zero and then we can also take that aperture and spin it by some angle theta its position angle and that means that this basic surcage fit has seven free parameters its flux its position its size and two that provide describe its ellipticity, and then ns here that describes the concentration of light towards the center or not. So even basic galaxy modeling is a seven parameter fit, and for low signal to noise galaxies, fitting seven free parameters can be a quite challenging job um, because these fits can be degenerate or unstable if there's not a lot of noise. So that's a, um, a downside of model fitting is it can become unstable. Now, one way you can make an unstable model more stable is to restrain its degree of freedom. And one way you could uh, drop one degree of freedom from this is by fixing this ns to be either 1, which is the exponential disk form that many spiral disks follow. And you could also choose n equals 4, which is the profile that fits most elliptical galaxies pretty well. Uh, and also the bulges of spirals are thought to follow this, perhaps. Um, although in detail, most of those follow something between one, one and four. But a lot of you'll see a lot of cases where um, in a survey, the data, the galaxies will be fit to both the disk and the bulge, and they'll keep the one that offered you that yielded the best chi-squared to that fit. Or you can have a disk plus bulge, where you give each galaxy a disk and a bulge, and you let them have uh, different fractions of the light. That's back to having seven free parameters. And you could even allow the disk and the bulge to have different sizes or different ellipticities and have more free parameters. Okay. Uh, now, an important thing and a virtue of these galaxy model fitting is that for any decent software these days, this is the model of what the galaxy looks like before the light came into the atmosphere and through the telescope. So this model is numerically smooth with the PSF before we compare it to the data. So what we're really doing is modeling the pre-seeing appearance. And uh, that's really important, right? That's allowing explicitly for the PSF makes these galaxy model fitting photometry more robust to the seeing than uh, other ways you can. All right, so here's the recipe for a galaxy model fitting is choose your model. Uh, you might choose some priors on those seven parameters, and then you do a least squares or a Markov chain to obtain um, the maximum posterior, maximum likelihood values of the parameters, and some confidence regions, some errors there. Okay, and a flux is just one of your seven parameters. Now, um, what are the good sides of this is it's very flexible. You can have data from multiple exposures that you're fitting simultaneously to the same model. You can have data from multiple filters where you're assuming that the galaxy has the same shape but different fluxes in the different filters. You can fit data where some of the pixels are no good because they had cosmic rays in them or there's a star here and I want to blot that part out of my fit to the galaxy. Right? Uh, and of course the best thing about model fitting is if the galaxy really does look like that model then model fitting is optimal. It's the best measurement you can make, the best signal to noise. It saturates the kramer rao bound. You can show that. <clears throat> it yields total magnitudes if your model for that galaxy is actually correct out to infinity. 
and it can be basically unbiased under different noise and seeing levels. And it also can yield true colors. But of course, the downside is, the main downside is that the galaxy probably does not obey the model. And so you get things that we sometimes call model bias. What it means is that this level of perfection is no longer true for that measurement. Um, that um, <clears throat> the colors will not be true colors, especially if um, the galaxy's color is not uniform. That is to say it has different shapes in different bands. And the magnitude will not be total if the wings of the galaxies do not behave just as the model assumes. And uh, the, the model, the answers can become seeing and noise dependent uh, when the model is not right. That's a little bit subtle, but that's the way it goes. Okay. Um, also, model fitting, the maximum likelihood value of model fitting, even if the model is correct, the maximum likelihood is biased. Uh, it will generally come up with the flux a little bit high. Um, and uh, those errors uh, scale as the inverse square of the signal to noise of the galaxy. And this arises because we're doing nonlinear fitting, which is sort of a long story. All right, so uh, there's one other kind of aperture that I want to talk about. In a lot of science, you don't really care about the total flux of the galaxy. For instance, in my favorite science of, of weak gravitational lensing, um, I just want to use the galaxy's fluxes in order to measure their photometric redshifts, which means I, I really want very precise colors, but it doesn't have to be the color of the entire galaxy. I want a very accurate color for a known part of the galaxy. Okay. And this means that uh, I have to look at the same set of stars intrinsically in that image, even if my different images were taken under conditions of varying seeing. So I'm going to mention here three different approaches to obtaining these true colors, these pre-seen colors. One is called PSF matching, which is where, say, I have a G and an R image. If the R image has better seeing than the G image, I intentionally blur the R image until its PSF is the same, is a replica of the G-band PSF. Then I can put an aperture on both of those images that's the same and I know that they will be including the same parts of the galaxy. The downside there is it's lowest common denominator, right? You have to blur your images to the seeing of the worst of all your images, which you may not want to do because that decreases your accuracy. Okay. Now, uh, I will talk in the second half of these lectures about something called um, Fourier domain moments. And uh, in the Fourier domain, you can take your image of the galaxy, Fourier transform it, and if you divide that by the Fourier transform of the PSF, that gives you data that's completely cleaned of the effects of the point spread function. And so you can basically do your aperture photometry in the Fourier domain, um, and it will get you an answer then that's independent of the scene. Uh, and I'd like to mention one other thing that's a method that's due to Conrad Koiken described in the paper referenced here, um, called GAP, or Gaussian Aperture Photometry. And this is a clever thing uh, where you can do the equivalent of this uh, Fourier domain moments, uh, except it's specialized to a Gaussian weighted aperture. And he showed that there are some subtle manipulations you can do on an image with an arbitrary PSF to obtain the flux that you would have gotten with a Gaussian aperture before there was a PSF. Uh, and again, this is something that allows you to get a true color from a galaxy. Right? In both these latter cases, in all of these cases, you can't use an aperture that's smaller than the original PSF, um, but you can still get something that fairly rigorously is a true color. All right, so the lesson of this is that um, for galaxy photometry, there's no one answer. Many different flux definitions exist. In fact, in the DES, there are more magnitudes in the uh, catalogs, more different kinds of magnitudes than there are pixels in a typical small galaxy image. Um, and uh, they don't necessarily have the same truth, that is what you would measure if there were no noise in the image. Okay? There's no single answer for the flux of a galaxy. The one that you should use out of all the magnitudes that you're given is the one that serves your science purpose the best. Do you care about total flux, 
Do you care about color? Um, you have a trade-off between those. And you also have a trade-off between signal to noise and how total your magnitude is. Okay. So be aware of what you need and also be aware of what you use. Don't just take a random magnitude out of a catalog and expect it to be unbiased or be the total magnitude or make you give you good colors. All right, you have to be a wise consumer of these magnitudes as well. This bunch of lectures then will we'll move from galaxy photometry to talking about galaxy shapes and sizes. But before we talk about how to measure them well, I'm going to give an introduction to why you would want to measure them to great precision and that is to pursue something called weak gravitational lensing. So we'll start with that motivation and then we'll move on to giving uh, some general and then some specific details about the ways that we can measure them. All right, so this all comes down to gravitational lensing, which I suspect most of you are familiar with to some extent. Uh, this is basically the um, the theory of general relativity, as posed by Albert Einstein, predicted the deflection of photons as they pass by massive objects. And of course, the original demonstration of this, the massive object was the sun. The photons were arising from a distant star. And because the photons are deflected by this angle alpha that uh, Einstein predicted, that if you look in the vicinity of the sun, it will appear to repel the stars. And this, of course, was verified in the total solar eclipse in 1919. And that's what made Einstein famous. Here's a New York Times article to prove it. Uh, and then Einstein also said, well, gee, if this mass were massive enough, then the light from the same source could make it to your eye from two different paths bending either direction around that. And that would mean that you, as the observer, would see a double image of the same source. Well, it took 60 plus years for that prediction to be uh, lead to a discovery, but now we see many cases like this where we have a massive deflector, say a cluster of galaxies, and here you can see not two, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different images of the same uh, strange figure eight shaped galaxy. So this is called strong lensing when you can basically split and recombine light rays. And of course, if you have a very nice symmetric situation, this time around this elliptical galaxy, you can get uh, these near ring shapes or Einstein rings. Okay. But that doesn't happen very often. Less than about one per thousand lines of sight in the universe pass close enough to a massive object that they can be strongly lensed. Much more common is to have a little bit of bending of the light by mass. And I'm going to illustrate what that would lead to here. This is called weak lensing. So here's just a fictional sky background where we have a bunch of circular lettered colored galaxies. And I'm going to put some mass in front of it. Okay, And then this is going to show you what that looks like as viewed um, from Earth, say. And indeed, galaxy A here, which was right near the axis of symmetry, the center of the mass, does turn into this ring-like structure. But what you see are that the other galaxies, well, they are stretched a little bit of the way into making a ring. Uh, so what you see is that even though none of them is you know, really obviously a ring or anything, there is a statistical tendency for them while they all want to align tangentially around the mass. Now that situation is idealized because galaxies aren't colored lettered circles. They're actually colored lettered ellipses, as we show here, where the galaxies have a random set of initial shapes. And then after their lens, they look like this. Now, if you look at one of these galaxies, say galaxy P here, you don't really know whether it was circular and ended up looking like that, or whether it was just born looking this way. That's its intrinsic shape. So what we do see, though, is that if we were to look at these galaxies, we would find that more of them are tangentially oriented than radially oriented. Because on average, they have a random orientation intrinsically, because there's no preferred direction in space. But the lensing effect stretches them a little bit. So this is called weak lensing, where no single galaxy really tips you off that it's lensed. But if you collect a lot of them, 
than this so-called shape noise, this intrinsic variation of their shapes, can be averaged down to reveal the distortion by gravitational lensing underneath. And while this seems like a very subtle thing and very it is weak, it, uh, remember that 99.9% .9 of galaxies are available for this kind of uh, analysis. And this actually allows us to take this shear pattern, this stretching, and if we can measure it, we can actually invert that relationship to figure out what the distribution of mass that caused the lensing is. And in case this seems like it should be impossible to you, I'll show you here that you can actually already do it in your head. Um, here is a picture of, uh, you know, some flowers. And here is a page from a catalog of what's called obscure glass that you might use on a shower stall. And you can look through at the image of the flowers and your brain can already tell you what the shape of the glass is. And here's a picture of the glass, right? So of course we can do this more mathematically um, for the universe, but uh, this just shows you that it's possible. All right, so there's this huge amount of information about mass in the universe, you don't have to see the mass that's doing the deflecting, and of course we know that five sixths of the mass in the universe is invisible. So there's a lot of motivation uh, to conduct this kind of weak lensing measurement. We need to image a lot of galaxies, right? The more galaxies we can measure, the uh, more subtle a signal we can detect here. And this was one of the prime motivations for building the Rubin Observatory. And in fact, we expect the Rubin Observatory to measure the shapes of nearly 1 billion galaxies over its footprint, which allows us to do uh, an extremely precise weak lensing measurement if we can measure these shapes without being biased by our measurement method itself. I'll assume now that you've been sold on this uh, very enticing idea of mapping out the gravitational potential or the matter content of the universe using these subtle uh, sheer, you know, stretchings of the images uh, uh, due to gravitational lensing or weak lensing. Okay. Well, let's think about how to do that. It's going to be hard because on a typical random line of sight, cosmological distances, uh, a galaxy will be stretched by only one or two percent. Okay. And remember that uh, we don't know the intrinsic shapes of galaxies. Galaxies typically have axis ratios that vary by 20 to 30 percent from equality. So any individual galaxy can only tell you about the shear to an accuracy of 20 or 30 percent. Um, so that sounds like this is going to make this impossible, right? Because we're looking for a signal that's much less than the built-in noise. But that's for one individual galaxy measurement that weak lensing is weak. But you can build strength in numbers here. As I mentioned, the LSST survey should measure the shapes of close to a billion galaxies, right? And so that means that in some sense we can measure the average weak lensing stretching by 0.2, say 20%, the shape noise, divided by the square root of 10 to the ninth, which ends up being 10 to the minus fifth, all right? And 10 to the minus five is a part in a thousand of the actual weak lensing signal that we expect. So Rubin has the capability to measure the weak lensing signals to tremendous overall precision. Signal to noise of maybe a thousand to one. But in order for that to be right, we have to measure all these shapes accumulating a bias in them that's less than this 10 to the minus five level, right? So that's very demanding. It's very hard to do. And of course, measuring shapes of galaxies, no one cared about until, well, it was about the time I got my PhD and I started working on this when it was a brand new thing and it's been about 25 or something years ago. Uh, so um, what do you need to do? You need to find some number that you can measure on every galaxy image that is changed when that weak lensing effect is present. Okay? Something that you can measure on the galaxy. And another thing about this measurement is that you have to know very well what it was before there was any lensing, right? Because if you just measure it, you can't tell whether it's been changed unless you know what it's like in the absence of lensing. Furthermore, you have to know how much this measurement 
changes, what's the slope basically of this measurement or the responsivity to an applied lensing distortion. Okay. Uh, so these mean that we have to first of all be able to remove the effects of the PSF. That is to say the, the, the optics of the atmosphere and, the, and of the telescope, they also distort galaxy images and we do not want to dis, uh, we don't want to confuse optical distortions that are nearby from gravitational lensing distortions. Okay. So we have to remove the PSF very carefully. That means we have to know the PSF very well, but of course, that's what stars are for, is they help you measure that, all right? And we would also like this measurement that we make to be able to be made at close to optimal. That is, we would like to be limited by this uh, intrinsic shape noise if the galaxy is reasonably bright. And of course, remember, it has to be a measurement that's not too hard to do because we have to do it a billion times on the real data, and we probably have to do it many billion times on simulated data to make sure we're doing this right. Okay, so what are these things that you can measure that tell you about weak lensing? Well, weak lensing can do several different kinds of things to your objects. One thing it can do is magnify or shrink. So the blue circle here shows, you know, some hypothetical unlensed shape of the um, of the galaxy and the dashed orange lines are showing what a positive and negative magnification signal would do and uh, what can we measure in order to detect that well there are two obvious things we can do we can measure the flux of the galaxy which is amplified when there is a magnification uh, and we could also measure its radius uh, if you're doing a model fitting to say a Sursich profile then the effective radius should increase as one plus kappa. Okay. We can also come up with a different way where we don't do model fitting. We can just measure moments of this galaxy and uh, we could measure its uh, total flux, right? Which would be a moment that uh, is just the intensity times the area. You'll see later we'll put a weight function inside here as we've been doing before so that we can make a moment function uh, that's about like flux. Or we could also do this radial moment that we've seen before, and those are changed by magnification too. Then the more the easier kind of uh, gravitational lensing signal to detect actually is called shear, and there's two different kinds of shear. Uh, one that's called the plus or the first component takes your circle and squishes it either on the x or the y axis, right? And if we were to take um, what do we call e plus, which is the ellipticity of our surface times the cosine of two times its position angle, that is altered by a shear in this plus direction, as is this second moment, which we'll call the plus moment. All right. And the other kind of shear is 45 degrees different from that. It changes galaxies like this. So there's three numbers in weak lensing that we can measure. These two are the most common. And the reason that these are easier is because we know that the universe is isotropic. So if there is no lensing in the line of sight you're looking at, then the average measured E or M plus or M cross should be zero, okay? E plus or E cross, right? That is to say a galaxy is just as likely to be stretched this way as this way. So because we know that the no lensing signal is zero, this is the favored and the most successful gravitational lensing measurement. And as you see, we could do it with model fitting or we could do it with moments. Now, before I show you the two methods that are most successful at measuring this to the necessary incredible accuracy, I just want to give you some rules of thumb about how precisely you can measure the shape of an object. And one thing I want to point out here is that the ellipticity that you see of a galaxy is diluted by the blurring of the PSF. So if I have a very tiny galaxy that's very elliptical and then I smear it, with a big PSF, it won't look very elliptical anymore. And the true ellipticity is reduced by this ratio here, uh, the radius squared of the galaxy divided by the radius of the galaxy squared plus the PSF size squared. So a well-resolved well galaxy, much bigger than a PSF, the PSF doesn't matter. But if you have a galaxy that's too small, uh, the intrinsic ellipticity is really hidden from you, which makes it very hard to measure. Another good rule of thumb that's related to some things that we saw in photometry and astrometry is that when you go to measure the ellipticity of this object on your image, 
Um, the accuracy to which you can do that, if you have a, a reasonably close to optimal model, is usually about one over the significance of that object, its flux significance. Okay? And if we're in a background limited situation, then the signal to noise ratio or the significance obeys this equation here. The significance squared is the signal squared, which is the flux squared, divided by the noise squared. And the noise is squared is n, our background noise level, times pi times the total area of the image, which has a contribution from the intrinsic size plus the PSF. So from these rules of thumb, you can take a given survey that you're going to do and you can guess uh, with reasonable accuracy how many galaxies uh, you're going to be able to actually measure shapes for. Okay. And another thing to remember is that this, of course, is the error in measuring the shape. But there is another error in determining the weak lensing signal, which is this shape noise that a typical galaxy's ellipticity varies by, you know, something like 15%. Okay. Okay, so the first successful method that I want to describe is something that's the most, uh, the farthest along in being applied to DES and to Rubin Observatory. Uh, and this is due to Rachel Mandelbaum, Eric Huff, and Aaron Sheldon. And the references to this and many other papers are at the end of the slides. Okay. And this starts with a model fitting exercise where you fit a Sursich model to your galaxy blob. You know, at least squares kind of fit. Uh, except that remember, the good way to do galaxy fitting for uh, model fitting for galaxies is to assume to fit basically your model as convolved with the known PSF. So that the E you obtain in this process is going to be uh, intrinsically uh, decontaminated from the PSF, right? If you do everything right, okay. Uh, there is a problem here, though, that uh, any model fitting method is inaccurate to some level on galaxies because the galaxies do not look like surfaces, right? Uh, another thing that's true is that maximum likelihood solutions are known to be biased, so you can't just take the best fit and roll with that. You will get some kind of biased estimate of the applied weak lensing shear uh, that's way too uh, inaccurate to be used for Rubin precision cosmology. So metacalibration is this very clever trick where you take the image of that galaxy and we would like to know how much its E, the measured E, would change if that galaxy were sheared. So how do you measure that? You take the galaxy and shear it and measure it again. Okay, So it's a little more complicated than that. You have to first deconvolve the image from the PSF because we want to shear the galaxy. We don't want to shear the PSF. So you deconvolve the PSF from the image. You shear the image. You reconvolve it and then measure it again. And by comparing this remeasurement to the original measurement, you know what the response of that galaxy, or in particular, the collection of all your galaxies is. And you can measure this to very high precision. All right, so this is, um, there are many more subtleties. I'm giving you a real quick version of this. But the idea is, if you uh, want to know what happens to the real sky when it gets sheared, then shear the real sky and see what happens. Okay. All right, the other method that I want to describe doesn't use model fitting. It uses the moments that we've run into before. And uh, this is something I came up with uh, with some of my collaborators, including Bob Armstrong, who's working on adapting this to Rubin data. Uh, it's called Bayesian Fourier Domain Moments, or BFD. And uh, it comes in two steps. The first step is to measure the galaxies. And what we do is we measure these moments that you've seen before, the flux, the radius, the plus, and the cross moments. And I'm putting little hats on them to show you that they're measurements, OK? And that we're going to measure them, though, in Fourier space. So we take the Fourier transform of our image, put it here. We divide it by the Fourier transform of the PSF. That removes all of the effect of the PSF. And then we're going to take these four moments that we talked about before, and we're going to put a weight function here, which is going to control the noise just like a weighted aperture in real space does. The other virtue of this way of compressing the image uh, information into just these four numbers is that it's constructed so that I understand very well what the 
measurement errors are here. So I can make a likelihood of uh, the measurement values relative to the truth. And that's critical for our next step, which is to actually calculate the rigorous Bayesian posterior probability uh, or this probability of measuring that data if there were a shear along the line of sight. And the way that we do that is to integrate over all possible true moments M, uh, the likelihood that we observed M had given those M, and then we need a prior, the probability that a, that a galaxy does have a certain true moment given that it has a certain shear on it. Well, how do we measure that prior? We get it by looking at the deep fields of a survey which have very low noise and therefore give us a very accurate measurement of the distribution in this moment space of all the galaxies that show up on the sky. And with these deep images, it's also easiest to, uh, for us to figure out how this distribution changes if we're looking at a sheared or a magnified version of the sky. Right. So that's the key to BFD and uh, it's fast and it works very well. So to summarize shape measurements, well, weak lensing cosmology has given us the motivation to open a new frontier in precision astronomical measurement by moving from the zeroth and first moments to the second moments, basically. Uh, and uh, we've worked really hard on trying to get these measurements to work well so that we can uh, measure weak gravitational lensing from Rubin and hopefully be limited by the actual information that's in those galaxies rather than being limited by some flaws or systematic errors in our measurements themselves. And we have two methods that we know can do this, at least on isolated galaxies, is BFD and Medi-Cal. And both of them, uh, they have a lot of things in common. First of all, if you don't have the right PSF, you're not going to get the right gravitational lensing shear. They both use the real sky to determine what the priors are of what kind of galaxies there are there and to measure to great accuracy how the real sky responds to the imposition of a shear. Both of them can combine data from many exposures and from uh, even different bands. And both of them can correct for selection biases, which I haven't discussed, but are also quite important. There's still plenty of work to do on these things. Uh, so there's lots of work going on under the Rubin umbrella. I invite you to join in it, uh, and um, especially there's a challenge I haven't talked about, which is what to do when galaxies overlap with each other. But let's forget about that for now and just be happy with the fact that we have some shape measurement methods that seem to work quite well.